Ebony Unicorn here with another installment of Malcolm X Speaks. I've noticed on the past two live streams that I've done and wrote to Malcolm X for some odd reason. For some odd reason, it blurs out Malcolm and it always goes Malm. Like on the last two live streams that I did. Anyhow, um, I've decided to just give in to all the Starbucks cups that we have around the house because indeed ours, <laughs> these are the only kind of cups that we uh, we have for the drinks. And there's that little Starbucks logo right there. And this is tea with cinnamon and ginger. So hi, Randy SoCal. It's very nice to see you. I tell you, all this morning talking has really gotten my voice a lot lower. Um, it's a lot of talking for me, honestly. Um, nevertheless, I want you to be able to distinguish between three voices. There are the preface statements to give you um, context by George Brightman. And then there are my reactions to the reading. Ebon, <laughs> let's watch some boob tube, baby. All right, so this is chapter three. And because chapter three is long, um, at least for listening purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and break this down like into a one hour live and then I'll do another one with a part with the same ballot or the bullet as well. More Malcolm, awesome. I love you, Eva. All right, so now this is a preface from George Brightman. 10 days after Malcolm X's Declaration of Independence, the Muslim Moss Inc. held the first of a series of four Sunday night public rallies in Harlem, at which Malcolm began the job of formulating the ideology and philosophy of a new movement. In the opinion of many who heard these talks, they were the best he ever gave. Unfortunately, taped recordings of these meetings were not available in the preparation of this book. Simultaneously, however, Malcolm began to accept speaking engagements outside of New York at Chester, outside of New York, at Chester, Pennsylvania, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, etc. And tapes of some of these were available. In the Cleveland talk given at the Cory Methodist Church on April 3rd, 1964, Malcolm presented many of the themes he had been developing in the Harlem rallies. The meeting sponsored by the Cleveland chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, that is CORE, took the form of a symposium entitled The Negro Revolt. What comes next? The first speaker was Louis E. Lomax, whose talk was in line with CORE doctrine, as in C-O-R-E, right? Uh, was in line with core doctrine and was well received by the large, predominantly Negro audience. Malcolm's talk got even more applause, although it differed in fundamental respects from anything ever said at a core meeting. <sighs> Let's see. And I just want to remind you all, I mean, I know that I'm dealing with an audience of primarily Gen Xers and Boomers, but for those of you who don't know, CORE is an acronym for Congress of Racial Equality. That is Congress of Racial Equality. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind getting the likes up. <clears throat> The Ballot or the Bullet, Malcolm's own title for his speech, was notable, among other things, for its statement that elements of Black nationalism were present and growing in such organizations as the NAACP and CORE. For various reasons, the Black Nationalist Convention, which in this talk he projected for August 1964, was not held. All right, y'all. These are the words of Malcolm here, and I will probably interrupt him and give side comments just so you know. Mr. Moderator, Brother Lomax, brothers and sisters, friends, and enemies. I just can't believe everyone in here is a friend, and I don't want to leave anybody out. The question tonight, as I understand it, is the Negro revolt, and where do we go from here? Or what's next? 
And my little humble way of understanding it, it points towards either the ballot or the bullet. Before we try to explain what is meant by the ballot or the bullet, I would like to clarify something concerning myself. I'm still a Muslim. My religion is still Islam. That's my personal belief, just as Adam Clayton Powell is a Christian minister who heads the Abyssinian Baptist, um, the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York but at the same time takes part in the political struggles to try to bring about rights to the black people in this country. And Dr. Martin Luther King is a Christian minister down in Atlanta, Georgia, who heads another organization fighting for the civil rights of black people in this country. And Reverend Gallimison, I guess you've heard of him, is another Christian minister in New York who has been deeply involved in the school boycotts to eliminate segregated education. Well, I myself am a minister not a Christian minister, but a Muslim minister, minister. And I believe in action on all fronts by whatever means necessary. Come on, Malcolm. Although I am still a Muslim, I'm not here tonight to discuss my religion. I'm not here to try to change your religion. I'm not here to argue or discuss anything that we differ about because it's time for us to submerge our differences and realize that it is best for us to first see that we have the same problem a common problem, a problem that will make you catch hell whether you're a Baptist, a Methodist, a Muslim, or a nationalist. Whether you're educated or illiterate, whether you live on the boulevard or in the alley, you're going to catch hell just like I am. We're all in the same boat and we all are going to catch the same hell from the same man. He just happens to be a white man. All of us have suffered here in this country political oppression at the hands of the white man, economic exploitation at the hands of the white man, and social degradation at the hands of the white man. <clears throat> now, in speaking like this, it doesn't mean that we're anti-white, but it does mean we're anti-exploitation. Come on, Malcolm. <clears throat> we're anti-degradation, we're anti-oppression, and if the white man doesn't want us to be anti-him, let him stop oppressing and exploiting and degrading us. Whether we are Christians or Muslims or nationalists or agnostics or atheists, we must first learn to forget our differences. If we have differences, let us differ in the closet. When we come out in front, let us not have anything to argue about until we could finish arguing with the man. If the late President Kennedy could get together with the, Khrush um, the Khrushchev and exchange some wheat, we certainly have more in common with each other than Kennedy and Khrushchev had with each other. And if I'm not saying Khrushchev's name the right way, I want somebody to let me know. Uh, hi, Fly Birdie. Let's see, so Khrushchev, K-H-R-U-S, and I'm just typing with one hand. And then I believe C-H-E-V. Thank you so much, Ebo. Very tempted to mod you. <laughs> Very tempted. Did I spell that the right way? Nope, I did not, but crush out. All right. If we don't do something real soon, I think you'll have to agree that we're going to be forced to either use the ballot or the bullet. It's one or the other in 1964. It isn't that time is running out. It's that time has run out. 1964 threatens to be the most explosive year America has ever witnessed, the most explosive year. Why? It's also a political year. It's the year when all of the white politicians will be back in the so-called Negro community, jiving you and me for some votes. The year when all of the white political crooks will be right back in your and my community with their false promises, building up our hopes for a letdown, with their trickery and their treachery with their false promises, which they don't intend to keep. As they nourish these dissatisfactions, it can only be, it can only lead to one thing, an explosion. And now we have the type of black man on the scene in America today. I'm sorry, uh, Brother Lomax, who just doesn't intend to turn the other cheek any longer. <laughs> don't let anybody tell you anything about the odds, uh, about the odds are against you. If they draft you, they send you to Korea and make you face 800 million Chinese. If you can be brave over there, you can be brave right here. These odds aren't as these odds aren't as great as those odds. And if you fight right, and if you fight here, you will at least know what you're fighting for. 
I'm not a politician. I'm not even a student of politics. In fact, I'm not a student of much of anything. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. And I don't even consider myself an American. If you and I were Americans, there'd be no problem. Those hunkies that just got off the boat, they're already Americans. Polacks are already Americans. The Italian refugees are already Americans. Everything that came out of Europe, every blue white thing is already an American. As long as you and I have been over here, we aren't Americans yet. Well, I am one who doesn't believe in deluding myself. I'm not going to sit at your table and watch you eat with nothing on my plate and call myself a diner. Sitting at the table doesn't make you a diner unless you eat some of what's on that plate. Being here in America doesn't make you an American. Being born here in America doesn't make you an American. Why, if birth made you American, you wouldn't need any legislation. You wouldn't need any amendments to the Constitution. You wouldn't be faced with the civil rights filibustering in Washington, D.C. right now. They don't have to pass civil rights legislation to make a Pollack an American. No, I'm not an American. I'm one of the 22 million black people who are the victims of Americanism. One of the 22 million black people who are victims of democracy. Nothing but disguised hypocrisy. So I'm not standing here speaking to you as an American or a patriot or a flag saluter or a flag waver. No, not I. I'm speaking as a victim of this American system. And I see America through the eyes of the victim. I don't see any American dream. I see an American nightmare. These 22 million victims are waking up. Their eyes are coming open. They're beginning to see what they used to only look at. They're becoming politically mature. They are realizing that there are new political trends from coast to coast. As they see these new political trends, it's possible for them to see that every time there's an election, the races are so close that they have, um, that, uh, they have to have a recount. They had to have a recount in Massachusetts to see who was going to be the governor. It was so close. It was the same way in Rhode Island, in Minnesota, and in many other parts of the country. And the same with Kennedy and Nixon when they ran for president. It was so close they had to count all over again. Well, what does this mean? It means that when white people are evenly divided and black people have a block of votes of their own, it's left up to them to determine who's going to sit in the White House and who's going to be in the doghouse. Now, I remember hearing the speech and, and uh, the round of applause uh, after he said the word doghouse. It was a black man's vote that put the president administration in Washington, D.C. Your vote, your dumb vote, your ignorant vote was wasted. A vote put in an administration in Washington, D.C. that has seen that has seen fit to pass every kind of legislation imaginable, saving you until the last, then filibustering on top of that. And your and my leaders have the audacity to run around clapping their hands and talk about how much progress we're making and what a good president we have. If he wasn't good in Texas, he sure can't be good in Washington, D.C. because Texas is a lynch state. Come on, Malcolm, and it still is. It is in the same breath as Mississippi. No different. Only they lynch you in Texas with a Texas accent. And in Mississippi, you in Mississippi, and they lynch you with a Mississippi accent. And these Negro leaders have the audacity to go and have some coffee in the White House with a Texan, a Southern cracker, that's all he is, and then come out and tell you and me that he's going to be better for us because since he's from the South, he knows how to deal with the Southerners. What kind of logic is that? Let Eastland be president. He's from the South, too. He should be better able to deal with them than Johnson. And this present administration... They have in the House of Representatives 257 Democrats and only 177 Republicans. They control two-thirds of the House vote. Why can't they pass something that will help you and me? In the Senate, there are 67 senators who are of the Democratic Party. Only 33 of them are Republicans. Why? The Democrats have got the government so sewed up, and you're the one who sewed it up for them. And what have they given you for it? Four years in office? And just now getting around to some civil rights legislation, just now, after everything else is gone, out of the way, they're going to sit down now and play with you all summer long? The same old giant con game that they call filibuster. All those are in cahoots together. Don't you ever think that they're not in, don't you ever think that they're not in cahoots together? For the man that is heading the civil rights filibuster is a man from Georgia named Richard Russell. When Johnson became president, the first man he asked for when he got back to Washington, Washington, D.C. was Dickey. That's how tight they are. 
He's again talking about Richard Russell. That's his boy. That's his pal. That's his buddy. But they're playing that old con game. One of them makes believe makes um, makes believe he's for you, and he's got it fixed to where the other one is so tight against you, he never has to keep his promise. Good cop, bad cop, y'all. So it's time in 1964 to wake up. And when you see them coming up with that kind of conspiracy, let them know your eyes are open. And let them know you got something else that's wide open too. It's got to be the ballot or the bullet. The ballot or the bullet. If you're afraid to use an expression like that, you should get on out of the country. You should get back in the cotton patch. You should get back in the alley. They get all the Negro vote. And after they get it, the Negro gets nothing in return. All they did when they got to Washington was give a few big Negroes big jobs. Those big Negroes didn't need big jobs. They already had jobs. That's camouflage. That's trickery. That's treachery. Window dressing. I'm not trying to knock out the Democrats for the Republicans. We'll get to them in a minute. But it is true. You put the Democrats first and the Democrats put you last. Look at it the way it is. What alibis do they use since they control Congress and the Senate? What alibi do they use when you and I ask, well, when are you going to keep your promise? They blame the Dixiecrats. What is a Dixiecrat? A Democrat. A Dixiecrat is nothing but a Democrat in disguise. The titular head of the Democrats is also the head of the Dixiecrats because the Dixiecrats are a part of the Democratic Party. The Democrats have never kicked the Dixiecrats out of the party. The Dixiecrats bolted themselves once, but the Democrats didn't put them out. Imagine these low-down Southern segregationists put the Northern Democrats down, but the Northern Democrats have never put the Dixiecrats down. No. Look at that thing the way it is. They've got a con game going on, a political con game. And you and I are in the middle. It's time for you and for me to wake up. And it's time to start looking at it like it is and trying to understand it like it is. And then we can deal with it like it is. The Dixiecrats in Washington, D.C. control the key committee, control the key committees that run the government. The only reason the, Dic the Dixiecrats control these committees is because they have seniority. The only reason they have seniority is because they come from the states where Negroes can't vote. This is not even a government that's based on democracy. It is, it's, it is not a government that is made up of representatives of the people. Half of the people in the South can't even vote. Eastland is not even supposed to be in Washington. Half of the senators and congressmen who occupy these key positions in Washington, D.C., are there illegally, are there unconstitutionally. I was in Washington, D.C. a week ago, Thursday, when they were debating whether or not they should let uh, the bill come onto the floor. And in the back of the room where the Senate meets, there's a huge map of the United States. On that map, it shows the location of Negroes throughout the country. And it shows that the southern sections of the country, the states that are the most heavily concentrated with Negroes, are the ones that have senators and congressmen standing up, filibustering, and doing all other kinds of trickery to keep the Negro from being able to vote. This is pitiful. But it's not pitiful for, pitiful for us any longer. It's actually pitiful for the white man because soon now, as the Negro awakens a little more and sees the vice that he's in, sees the bag that he's in, sees the real game that he's in, then the Negro is going to develop a new tactic. The senators and congressmen actually violate the constitutional amendments that guarantee the people of that particular state or county the right to vote. And the constitution itself has within the machinery to expel any representative from a state where the voting rights of the people are violated. You don't even need new legislation. Any person in Congress right now who is there from a state or a district where the voting rights of the people are violated, that particular person should be expelled from Congress. And when you expel him, you've removed one of the obstacles in the path of any real meaningful legislation in this country. In fact, when you expel them, you don't need new legislation because they will be replaced by black representatives from counties and districts where the black man is the majority, not in the minority. If the black man in the Southern states has his full voting rights, the key Dixiecrats in Washington, DC, which means the key Democrats in Washington, DC would lose their seats. 
And for those of you who don't know what Dixie is, Dixie is the South. The Democratic Party itself would lose its power. It would cease to be powerful as a party. When you see the amount of power that would be lost by the Democratic Party, if it were to lose a Dixie crack wing or a branch or element, you can see where it is, where it's against the interests of the Democrats to give voting rights to Negroes in the states and the states where Democrats have been in complete power and authority ever since the Civil War. You can't just belong to that party without analyzing it. I say again, I am not anti-Democrat. I'm not anti-Republican. I'm not anti-anything. I'm just questioning their sincerity. And some of the strategy that they've been using on our people by promising them promises that they don't intend to keep. When you keep the Democrats in power, you're keeping the Dixiecrats in power. I doubt that my good brother Lomax will deny that. A vote for a Democrat is a vote for a Dixiecrat. That's why in 1964, it's time now for you and me to become more politically mature and realize what the ballot is for, what we're supposed to get when we cast a ballot. And that if we don't cast a ballot, it's going to end up in a situation where we're going to have to cast a bullet. It's either, a, it's either a ballot or a bullet. And I'm going to close pretty soon here. Uh, in the North, they do it a different way. They have a system that's known as gerrymandering. Come on, Malcolm. Whatever that means. It means when Negroes become too heavily concentrated in a certain area and begin to gain too much political power, the white man comes along and changes the district lines. Then and now. Gerrymandering is happening today, now. You may say, why do you keep saying white man? Because it's the white man who does it. I haven't ever seen any Negro changing any lines. They don't let them get near the line. It's the white man who does this. And usually it's the white man who grins at you the most and pats you on the back and is supposed to be your friend. He may be friendly, but he's not your friend. So, what I'm trying to impress upon you, in, in essence, is this. You and I are in America faced not with a segregationist conspiracy. We're faced with a government conspiracy. Everyone who's filibustering is a senator. That's the government. Everyone who's finagling in Washington, D.C. is a congressman. That's the government. You don't have anybody putting blocks in your path, but people who are a part of the government, the same government you go to. The same government you go abroad to fight and die for is the government that is in the conspiracy to deprive you of your voting rights, deprive you of your economic opportunities, deprive you of decent housing, deprive you of a decent education. You don't need to go to the employer alone. It's the government itself, the government of America that is responsible for the oppression and exploitation and degradation of black people in this country. And you should drop it in their lap. This government has failed the Negro. The so-called democracy has failed the Negro <clears throat> and is still failing the Negro. And all these white liberals have definitely failed the Negro. So where do we go from here? First, we need some friends. We need some new allies. The entire civil rights struggle needs a new interpretation, a broader interpretation. We need to look at the civil rights thing from another angle from the inside as well as from the outside, to those of us whose philosophy is black nationalism, the only way you can get involved in the civil rights struggle is give it a new interpretation. That old interpretation excluded us, it kept us out. So we're giving a new interpretation to the civil rights struggle, an interpretation that will enable us to come to it, take part in it. And these handkerchief heads who have been dilly-dallying and pussyfooting and compromising, we don't intend to let them pussyfoot and dilly-dally and compromise any longer. How can you thank a man for giving you what's already yours? How then can you thank him for giving you only part of what is already yours? You haven't even made progress. If what's been given to you, you should have already had. That's not progress. And I love my brother Lomax. The way he pointed out we're right back where we were in 1954. We're not even as far up as we were in 1954. We're behind where we were in 1954. <clears throat> and just so y'all know, we are behind 1954 still today in 2020. You better believe that when it comes to housing laws and incarceration and economic inclusion, you better believe it. There's more segregation now than there was in 1954. 
There's more racial animosity and more racial hatred and more racial violence today in 1964 than there was in 1954. Where is the progress? And now you're facing a situation where the young Negroes coming up, they don't want to hear that turn the other cheek stuff. No. In Jacksonville, those were teenagers. They were throwing the Molotov cocktails. <laughs> Negroes have never done that before. But it shows you that there's a new deal coming in. There's a new thinking coming in. There's new strategy coming in. It'll be the Molotov cocktails this month and hand grenades next month or something else next month. It'll be ballots or it'll be bullets. It'll be liberty or it'll be death. The only difference about this kind of death is it'll be reciprocal. You know what that, you know what is meant by reciprocal? That's one of Brother Lomax's words. I stole it from him. <laughs> I don't usually deal with those big words because I don't usually deal with big people. I deal with small people. I find you can get a whole lot of small people and whip the hell out of a whole lot of a big, a whole lot of big people. They haven't got anything to lose. They've got everything to gain. And they'll let you know in a minute. It takes two to tango. When I go, you go. I'm going to pause here and talk to you because that was a shit ton of um, information. Uh, vocabulary words for people who don't know uh, terms like gerrymandering. I learned gerrymandering was on when I was an undergrad at the University of Washington. I had no idea what it was before then. Um, changing district lines. Yes, Evo, as a matter of fact, when black people get too much power in one area, and please, if you don't mind, get the likes up. When black people get their numbers up in one area and they end up with a lot of voting and political power and they end up, you know, bossing up over the school districts and bossing up over public po policy and becoming a force to be rec reckoned with, they will literally have a district that, let's say it's lined like a square. All of a sudden, they'll turn that shit into a hexagon to make sure they get enough black people outside of it and return the white people in that neighborhood to power. If you have, would just see some of the lines created via gerrymandering in Seattle, Washington, while people are telling you it's so liberal here, it's fucking shocking. I mean, people will gerrymander to the point where like, it looks like a damn stick figure or a damn abstract painting. And it's just like, my nigga, that's not a neighborhood. That's not a district. That's a con. <laughs> that's a con. That's not that real hood, but they will re-outline that shit every time. Banks will do the same thing with redlining. When they want a neighborhood of people who are worthy of getting loans, they'll just keep redlining, redlining, redlining until every Negro is out and all the Asians that are there in the hood can get there. Uh, you wonder why, you know, certain people own your corner stores and certain people don't. It's not that black people are not trying. And we feed each other that rhetoric. Oh, you lazy Negro, you're not doing nothing. Get up, get up, get up. We go to the bank like the Asian man goes to the bank, like the white man goes to the bank, and we go with our same 750 credit score, whatever it is, and we ask for loans and we don't get them. While Mr. Kim gets his. And Mr. White gets his. Like, the scary thing about this book the scary thing about the voice of Malcolm X is that this is a man who died just a few years after. I mean, he's talking 1964. What did he, he passed in 1968 and it's 2020 and he's still talking like he's still here. He's still talking like he's still here. Y'all, he's still talking like he's still here. So much of this then as now. So much of the problems he's discussing in this book were happening then as they are now. You think gerrymandering is not a thing anymore? You think redlining is not a thing anymore? You think broken promises from a politician isn't a thing anymore? You think Democrats and Dixiecrats aren't a thing anymore? Black people have empowered the Democrats. White people are split evenly in being Democrats and Republicans. It is us who give to either power its party. If we wanted to be Republicans tomorrow, Republicans would run everything. If we wanted to be Dem you know, Democrats tomorrow, continue that way, you see they dominate office. Dixiecrats will openly shit on Northern Democrats, Yankees. 
But you better believe a Yankee Democrat is not going to shit on a Dixiecrat. And again, a Dixiecrat is nothing but a Democrat from Dixie. Now, what is Dixie? Dixie is everything below the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton, cinnamon seed, and sandy bottom. Get away, get away, get away, Dixieland. I wish I was in Dixie, away, away. Something, something, something to live and die in Dixie. Away, away, away down south to Dixie. Dixie, one of my favorite singing groups, Dixie Chicks. Why are they Dixie Chicks? because they're below the Mason-Dixon line. I said because they're below the Mason-Dixon line. Everything below the Mason-Dixon line is Dixie and Dixiecrats run Democrats. Black, white, and white liberal. There's a reason Malcolm is questioning these people's sincerity. There's a period of time in history where the KKK traded in their white robes for navy blue and badges. There's a reason the slave catching paddy wagon has the same little star as a police sheriff star. They look the same. I might make that the new uh, thumb, uh, what is it, thumbnail for this so that you understand what I'm talking about. I'm not a radical, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican but there's nothing I can do about being Eidos. And there's nothing I can do about, you know, the truth is the truth, wherever you find it. I'm gonna read some of your comments. Other races get handouts from the government to start businesses in black neighborhoods. Randy SoCal, I've never seen you make such a right statement before. Those are 100% facts. I don't vote the system wasn't designed for black Americans. We need our own black nation and system. Damn, I click on the video and just see titties. Damn. GA boy, what's going on with you, brother? What's up, chat? Happy New Year's, everyone. Happy New Year's to you. Happy New Year to you. I'm reading your comment. You know, it's so funny with Black people, we get stuck between a uh, New Year's Eve and Happy New Year, and the word ends up running together in Happy New Year's. <laughs> Happy New Year to you, brother. Yes, we understand the system, Queen. Okay, well... I feel like that was a long enough live in terms of reading just because you want to go section by section and really think over these things and give commentary and mull it over in your mind before you move on in a book like that. Or at least that's the best way for me to do it. Um, let's see. Mason Dixon line state, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and stink ass Tennessee. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. I love to hear lovely T go, ratchet ass Florida. <laughs> I mean, the, the, there's an image, a cartoon, Looney Tunes, where Bugs Bunny is sawing so, uh, Florida off the rest of uh, mainland North America. And I'm like, come on, Bugs. <laughs> there was that, um, that thing where people were Googling Florida man and their birthday. And every freaking day of the year, there was a man from Florida doing some weird shit, sucking blood, literal vampirism, you know, feeding people to crocodile, just, just crazy shit happens in Florida. Thank you, Evo. Oh, thank you so much. So if no one has any more questions or comments, you know, we've got that out of the way where we understand what filibustering is. Anybody understand? So basically somebody's trying to pass legislation and you just get up there and bullshit because there's a certain time allotment that you're working with and then everybody has to go home. So you can be up there talking for two goddamn hours when somebody is trying to pass, you know, a civil rights law and, oh, look, it's time to go home. And then you go home and shit doesn't get passed. Your change is not made because of filibustering. <laughs> They're busting up legislation by using filler, filler conversation. How you doing? How your mama doing? How your papa doing? How your daddy doing? How your nieces doing? Your nephews, your in-laws? Like, wh what is this conversation about? Why are you talking so slow? Why are you asking me pointless things? Why are you making point? Oh, you're filibustering. You're avoiding some shit. So 
take home lesson, filibustering, gerrymandering, Dixiecrats. From this conversation, from this reading of Malcolm X speaks, speaks, everybody should know what those are. Now again, sure, some of this dated, <laughs> I would say maybe by a small margin, maybe by a small margin. Oh my God, I just had a ton of ginger and cinnamon at the bottom of the cup that I just uh, just swallowed up really quick. All right, uh, I'll watch the replay, Queen. I'm about to get on my bike and go out on my motorcycle. Peace in your next live. My next live is gonna come up really soon, Randy SoCal. So thank you so much. Um, like, share, subscribe, share the video because um, the information is as beautiful as the view. All right. I said the information is as beautiful as the view. The information is as desirable as the view. I'm up at a unicorn. And this was Malcolm X Speaks. And I'm out.